Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the post lunch session. So you all are in hyperglycemic as well as hyperattention in phase of post lunch. And relevant topic, the first speaker, Dr. Sandeep Mathur. Uh, lipodystrophy and thin type phenotype, what is common in them? I invite Dr. Sandeep Mathu. He is a senior professor and head of the Department of Endocrinology and Inchard Molecular Genetic Research Lab, SMS Medical College, Jaipur. His key interest is molecular genetics of hormone and metabolic disease as well as adipose tissue biology research. He is a recipient of Commonwealth Academic Star Fellowship, travel award by F USA, and merit award by Government of Rajasthan in the public team, and several other awards like Times of India and Economic Times. He has multiple publications in the national as well as international journals. He has a research achievement like reporting. Chapter 14 CNP syndrome, so called Turner syndrome spectrum disorder. Concept of inhibiting fat is a functional defect of lipodystrophy gene and decoding cellular as well as molecular traces of thin fat phenotype, etc. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, thanks to organizers and thanks to chairperson and thanks for the uh, I requested him because I will learn from him after this work. So, actually, uh, in fact, you know, I will talk about it a lot. But is any common thread between this phenotype in our country and the real genetic disorder, something like quality disorder, related to our community, and that is your life response? What is actually the common thread between two disorders? Number two, so what I want to point out in which way is our epidemic of T2DM metabolic syndrome this part of the region is an epidemic of functional life of So what I want to come is a new concept of the disease because you know that is a complex state, so many genes, so many knows. But if you nail down the few tracks, rare disease, 33 tract disease. And there is a scope to develop diagnostic and therapeutic strategy very specific. So the complex state can be simplified. So the PPT is a 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 PPT is Corrected by the absence of the health issue. That is their correct. Subcutaneous fat is not there. And these are some, uh, your famous uh, DEXA picture. Though we are now with MRI, uh, we are not with DEXA. And you know, there is a loss of some input. Me but other facet of the coin is that in all these disorders, we have a decrease of combination, output, output. Uh, but some of these are in the subscapular as well as the visceral joint. So it is redistribution of the fat. But problem starts from the subcutaneous fat. Actually, I am raising a serious question of visceral fat theory of type 2 diabetes and all this kind. So, Yagnik sir, I will now most stringent comment. But then, Nandan, I will now. Best criticism is that I can do better. Yes, video capture. You see, there are no more categories. Video camera. Congenital, either congenitalist or familial partial. They may be acquired like what is called. Yes, I will now. 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 Camera, 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 camera,
family studies they identified in the linkage analysis in the family they identified the genes in the lipodystrophy families and these syndromes have some peculiar clinical features which you should know about and you can pick up the patient in your practice but you see most important characteristic is loss of subcutaneous fat but what i want to find mechanism category this is basically disorder of triglyceride handling in your subcutaneous adipose tissue that is the main defect either it's a failure of triglyceride synthesis lipid droplet dysfunction and poor adipogenesis the whole story is focusing on the one single process adipogenesis sir actually in next uh, pune i will speak on that point whole story of indian epidemics focus on one cellular process epi uh, epi uh, uh, adipogenesis and that if you correct that many problem can be sorted out and your all stories of insulin adlp and all this all the story will be your supportive therapy like paracetamol in your malaria so tartar caviolar uh, is one of the mechanism in different mechan different diseases genetic basis is known and the defects are in again in the triglyceride handling in adipocyte either nuclear amyloid perturbation defect in adipogenesis lipid droplet dysfunction lipid droplet dysfunction and so on and some process are related to dna repair also because molecular biology going to the extent of dna repair and all these things they they, they are actually window through we can look for gene therapy and gene manipulation so this whole story is around your triglyceride handling and particularly the process of adipogenesis or lipid droplet formation so adipocyte difference regulation is the basis of all lipodystrophies and most of the gene converge on the pathway either adipocyte development by adipogenesis or adipocyte storage of triglyceride the whole story now i want to tell you is that this is similar to your type 2 patho metabolic syndrome pathophysiology or adiposopathy i will talk about that in pune so same mechanism your adipocytes can't hold your triglyceride and fat because it can't hold it it goes to ectopic site and create all the problems and this mechanism is shared by both obesity obesity the problem is sir uh, yagnik sir your theory load and capacity load is heavy capacity is also good but exhausted obesity and your dysmetabolism when the capacity is very low in terms of your adipocyte handling of the triglyceride and i have evidence to that how it is important most important and this capacity is shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and that leads to even with the normal load it becomes dysfunctional so this is the balance of these two things now is limitation so inference is is this limitation adipose tissue to store triglyceride that is underlying pathophysiology defect of both lipodystrophy obesity insulin resistant state and metabolic syndrome so they have common very common pathophysiologic thread both of them what is the clinical manifest lipodystrophy syndrome you see these clinical manifestations are almost similar to your metabolic syndrome manifestations you know but there are few differences what i want to tell you uh, i will come to that point now one important pertinent clinical question to general uh, uh, practice how to recognize these syndromes in your practice you see there are few fundamental differences lipodystrophy and your insulin resistance and, and metabolic syndrome that lipodystrophy are relatively severe syndromes when we come to we diagnose through family tree you know family we diagnose and we come to the we do genetic testing and come to a syndrome they have very serious problem but you see loss of fat and low weight are characteristic of lipodystrophies number 2 leptin is low in your lipodystrophy it is high in, in metabolic syndrome so these are few fundamental differences the percentage fat is lipodystrophy much much less in your subcutaneous waist circumference is very low so whenever you see a patient with very poor waist circumference always think of lipodystrophy actually these are western countries thing when we come to our country you may have so many patient in your practice i am coming to that point and severe to hypertriglyceridemia all the things are there in lipodystrophy syndromes and when to suspect it's uh, it uh, american uh, the endocrine society given guidelines this is generalized or regional absence of body fat you don't find any fat around here anywhere in the body but failure to thrive in infants and children who has diabetes prominent muscles your prominent veins severe acanthosis nigricans eruptive xanthomas cushingoid appearance sometimes we suspect cushing and cushing does not turn out they could be lipodystrophy and we we miss the diagnosis 
Acromegaloid appearance, many patients, you know, diabetic comes to us who are acromegaloid appearance, their fat is prominent and their jaw is large. They might be suffering from lipodystrophy and we should think in terms of that. Similarly, if a patient requires then more than two units of insulin per kilogram body weight, seriously consider lipodystrophy or they require more than 200 units of insulin or triglyceride more than 500. I know many patients I treated hypertriglyceridemia and with so many medicine, all these things. And they were suffering from lipodystrophy and we were treating with insulin and other things without realizing and the whole family was suffering. So, in number two, uh, that uh, they have voracious appetite. So I've shown this picture. If you find very thin limbs and a fold of fat on the abdomen, or in you pick up it like this, it's like your cushingoid. Huh? It's like you can pick it up like a very thin fold of your skin. You know, no fat here in the cheeks. Prominent muscular appearance, a diabetic, looks very muscular, consider lipodystrophy. Acromegaloid appearance of the hands. I've seen many patients with diabetic who have acromegaloid appearance in the hand and their IJ1 is normal. Similarly, if the patient has early aging, you know, he looks very old when he's 35 years, he's, he's bald and he looks the all, you know, uh, string, this, all these features of the obesity there. Then hypertriglyceridemia, uh, this uh, gentileshma, and prominent veins. These are the physical signs you should suspect uh, this syndrome. Now approach. Here it is very important. If you clinically suspect lipodystrophy, look into the family history, then go for genotyping. Actually, if you ask me application of genetics, apart from Moody, I would consider, actually I am working on this project also at this moment, that lipodystrophy syndrome could be picked by your whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing. But, sir, uh, what I want to do, I want to develop our own database of genetic polymorphs. That's why I was out of diabetes in for two, three years because I'm a busy in that project actually. We have our own database because we are entirely different in the Caucasians. We are not same because this lipodystrophy syndrome might be there in their population, not that so common, but it is very common in our country. So you can, there's a track. If there is an autoimmune for thyroid problem with uh, diabetes, consider uh, autoimmune uh, lipodystrophy syndrome in these patients. Then the patient have vitiligo, diabetes, hypothyroidism consider lipodystrophy, then you go for lipodystrophy marker. But leptin, unfortunately, is still not a very good diagnostic test because its labels overlap a lot. Now, these are certain clinical conditions. They also have loss of fat. They also mimic uh, lipodystrophy in clinical grounds. Now, lipodystrophy mimic metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance state clinically, but one should have eye index suspicion. And what is Indian fat phenotype? You know, we always talk visceral fat, abdominal fat, abdominal fat. You know, the whole story is everyone's mind is only not beyond this. But you see, we did this work. Unfortunately, sir, this slide is little in the sense. This is taken from the poster. This paper was accepted for presentation during endocrine society. We could not attend there. We created the poster. Now, full text is submitted to class one. What we find, definitely diabetics had higher visceral fat. This is MRI study. We did on 100. 30 patients actually MRI and what you find diabetes higher visceral fat a little uh, higher uh, subcutaneous fat ectopic fat was also very high in diabetics so this was expected similarly metabolic syndrome all three compartment higher fat but when you come to correlation HOMA IR correlates with your uh, ectopic fat metabolic syndrome correlates with ectopic fat not to the intra abdominal non subcutaneous fat there is no correlation Number two, in this category, even your visceral fat is protected with low, uh, actually, HOMA IR, and it is very pathologic in higher. So this, this picture is the correct picture, I can tell you, sir, have a look at it. You know, visceral fat amount increase, the quarter is the HOMA IR. Actually, nobody has uh, actually attempted this, dividing patient according to quartiles of HOMA IR. We divided, we did not find any such work in the, in the literature. What happens as your vectopic fat rises, your HOMA IR goes up, same time your subcutaneous fat amount goes down. So what we call nutrient overflow is basically a feature of your highest quartile of your HOMA IR. It is not for everyone. And visceral fat initially it is protective. So nutrient overflow hypothesis, you know, if your nutrient goes from subcutaneous compartment to your vis ectopic compartments, this is the main culprit of all the problems. And you remember, 
surgical removal of omentum has no benefit that is i think the best evidence the whole story of whom we are visceral fat is and see so this is newton overflow hypothesis is correct it is not visceral fat we call intra abdominal fat that is nothing to do with your fall or it whatever it does is very limited but we have to do some more studies actually dr kochupelli told me long back to take samples of you know adipocytokine during a cardiac uh, cath studies and all this i will do that and prove that actually at the next step and i will look for your guidance sir at this uh, for that kochupelli told me that idea long back now is it peripheral fat yes let us look at most prominent um, you know most uh, well uh, quoted indian study dr uh, anup mishra's study he said it is yes they have more hepatic fat pancreatic volume and all these things but see their peripheral fat was less in their study and there, there were not much talk about on the discussion similarly the landmark study sir you must be knowing about it this the early life study everybody talk of subscapular fat nobody talk about less uh, triceps fat you know indian children at the birth as well as at the four years of age had less fat in their uh, actually uh, upper limbs that was not even talked much about and that was something you know because all were obsessed with the idea of visceral fat visceral fat central fat central fat because that is close to your liver so it is thin fat phenotype is basically a partial lipodystrophy now i am coming to the main point of my presentation is it partial lipodystrophy what is the cellular basis less peripheral fat actually we took up our own data unfortunately is full text is still in a final presentation to submit but we presented a poster during endocrine society meeting and we could not present but virtually it was presented what we find you know adipocyte size is the best marker of adipogenesis poor adipogenesis my opinion is the main culprit so i look for adipocyte size adipocyte size was higher only in the peripheral subcutaneous fat not in the abdominal fat or it was marginally high so pathology was more in peripheral fat but there are different cohorts of patient not in the abdominal compartment number 2 it is the adipocyte size that correlated with not only your bmi waist circumference waist ratio homa ir it correlated in the thigh so sir what we presume more abdominal fat it is not quantity it is adipocyte size and poor adipogenesis we measure i am not discouraging the concept of waist circumference because this reflects your adipocyte size and we can have more data sir with you and with some better technology so basically what comes here around is basically your adipocyte size because this could not grow this cells are increasing in size and that is manifesting here this is not the amount of fat in the your, your uh, uh, mri which is on in the omentum similarly what we find definitely what are the size of correlated abdominal basis of proteins but that is the size of the mri naam change kar do you all allow adipocyte
Not only this, modules of co-express gene, if you ask me the functional unit of all this matter, they are the co modules of co-express genes because they are regulated by single transcription factors. So I have one paper in Nature Scientific Report where I documented it. So these modules correlate with all intermediate phenotypes. Adipose tissue pathology, adipose site size, HOMA, IR, your adipose cytokine, and your HB1C level. The whole trajectory is now seen through this molecular function. In my nature genetic, uh, sorry, nature scientific report, I go into the genetic mapping of those also. That I will discuss in Pune next week. So number one, number two, the same th study we replicated, we find these all genes which are expression profiling, because we are expert in transcription profiling, multi-omics, and gene expression patterns and molecular function, and these molecular functions basically converge on the pathological process of adipogenesis. I have shown in the cell cellular level, and molecular level also find it is poor adipogenesis in peripheral fat, that is playing a role, that is mimicking your lipodystrophy syndrome. So this is how it mimics. Is phenol lipodystrophy genetically distinct entities? No. This is literature, insulin resistant score from your Jivas. Sir. Jivas is something obsolete, I will say, but it has a background information. And the, it's a score of insulin resistant Jiva in a gene uh, dose in score was associated with lower BMI. You know, genes which are making susceptible to diabetes, they are having associated with lower BMI. And glutofemoral, less glutofemoral face mass. So, gene association study also proved the same thing. It is less fat in the periphery. Similarly, this Nature Genetics paper 2017, I can come to the conclusion, 53 genomic regions associated with insulin resistant phenotype and association with lower adipose tissue mass and peripheral compartment was shown. Even gene association level also said this, your dismatum correlated with less peripheral fat. And also familiar partial lipodystrophy genes and they were converging on each other in the, actually they could not do functional genomics, we are done the functional genomics. Now we come to our own concept. One night, uh, one afternoon, my uh, resident Haldreva Ramaj is speaking here around, I think not in this hall. The lipodystrophy, this gene, I was listening to this. I said, oh, lipodystrophy can be functional defect of your lipodystrophy gene, type 2 diabetes. Because I had a data of transcription profiling of fat tissue. So what we did, we looked in gene mania. Gene mania, is actually, our strength is gene network analysis. Actually, no gene works in isolation. Gene works in a network. So our strength is gene network analysis and we look for gene network of metabolic syndrome related genes. What we find all seven, eight, nine genes were there in that gene mania of metabolic syndrome related this. So that means this is functional defect. And we find all the genes which are causing lipodystrophy converge on adipose tissue uh, differentiation and adipose apoptosis pathways. So lipodystrophies are experiment of the nature, genetic polymorphs of the genes which are playing role in adipose tissue development and functioning and death. So nature's experiment, deleterious mutation lead to severe disease. With this concept, I developed a actually uh, a network of lipodystrophy gene and look, I find many of genes were upregulated in our database. So we came with the concept, idea that type 2 diabetes may be functional defect of lipodystrophy gene. If this gene is defective protein structure, it will lead to lipodystrophy. Its expression is less. It is there, it is normal structure. But the expression that will lead to your type 2 diabetes. Because I change the story from complex state of type 2 diabetes to peripheral fat, peripheral fat I leads to some lipodystrophy genes, and can it help in its functional defect. So in the second experiment, what we did, we looked for common pathophysical thread between Indian diabetics thin fat phenotype and partial lipodystrophy, peripheral tissue transcriptomic evidences. We developed actually a network of lipodystrophy gene, looked for X expression. Simultaneously, we looked for expression of, uh, I can go to the next slide. There was an 18% overlap between network of lipodystrophy gene and differential expression gene in peripheral circular tissue. This is so, so much, you know. 18% common thread is there because in any tissue there are so many other pathways are acting place for 18% overlap. So this is a, a good overlap. Secondly, I tried to classify, this is a more important part of my presentation. Fortunately, I got a grant from RSEDA thanks to Dr. Bansi that I got a grant from RSEDA and I have replicated this work and hopefully I will present during next uh, this RSEDA meeting. I can subcluster my diabetic patient on the basis of expression of these genes. 
सो कॉम्प्लेक्स ट्रेड ट्वेंटी थ्री थाउजेंड जीन परम्यूटेशन कॉम्बिनेशन सिक्स थाउजेंड जेनेटिक पॉलिम ऑफ स्टडी इट विल कन्वर्ज इन द फ्यू जीन्स एंड अदर वे राउंड नेक्स्ट फेज आई विल बी कमिंग विद लाइपोडिस्ट्रॉफी जीन्स कमिंग आउट ऑफ माई ट्रांसक्रिम प्रोफाइलिंग एंड विल सर्च फॉर लाइपोडिस्ट्रॉफी इन जनरल पेशेंट दैट्स वाई एम इंटरेस्टेड इन जनरल पेशेंट डॉक्टर प्लीज पिकअप लाइपोडिस्ट्रॉफी कैन आई कैन हैव मोर प्रेडिग्रीज a transcription profiling identified gene and i will look in the gene sequence or gene regulator in those families so we will have a large so whatever epidemic today is a lipodystrophy epidemic functional lipodystrophy epidemic so uh, i come to its point any specific treatment yes i think i can omit these slides what happens lipodystrophy has some something common with the treatment part also because metformin insulin and thiazolidines are used for lipodystrophy also Many of dyslipidia, hypertension, liver disease, and lipodystrophy same as we do in type 2 diabetes. Metronidazole leptin is a drug which was developed for actual lipodystrophy syndrome. Unfortunately, this drug was not much helpful in the management of diabetes mellitus. So, both lipodystrophy and thin fat phenotype, I am talking therapeutic part, complication like T2D, hypertension, dyslipidia are treated on same lines, but a specific drug developed for lipodystrophy is not effective for management of T2D because there is a mechanism that uh, distracts because that acts on only only leptin level no other pathway of your lipodystrophy syndrome so conclusion is that lipodystrophy is a relatively rare and heterogeneous group of disorder they could be genetic or acquired cardinal feature of which is complete or partial loss of adipose tissue this phenotype particularly partial lipodystrophy resemble thin fat diabetic the central pathophysiology mechanism thin fat phenotype is failure of peripheral adipose tissue to store fat the underlying pathophysiology mechanism both includes impaired adipogenesis and other lipid storage defects in peripheral adipose tissue glutathione adipose tissue both of them not only resemble phenotypically they share genetics predisposition and functional genomic mechanisms and lipodystrophy need to be diagnosed in clinical practice because there are specific and effective therapy available for them like metronidazole so thank you very much for your patience here thank you thank you sir for wonderful Very interesting and informative talk on lipodystrophy, and you have very simple part to identify the lipodystrophy and its clinical relevance. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have a discussion session after all the three. Okay. okay. Then any question? Let me comment from our esteemed senior faculties because I think this is a very offbeat topic for most of our clinicians, and so it is presented uh, in a fantastic way. Uh, so a quick comment, and then I would request Sir to once again, just uh, as you said, sir, that lipidemic trophy needs a very high index of suspicion. So for the primary care physicians, if you could just quickly. Uh, Sort of give us uh, a few points that they should look into their patients who are going to come. Yeah. So we do some. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yes.
and I think you know more about it. My take on things that originally was that it's an epigenetic thing, driven by intra-uterine undernutrition. And that still stands. I mean, this previous paper which you showed was actually driven by me. In the sense that after I wrote my paper, I was looking for data sets where similar measurements were made. And uh, that should say anything. So, triceps and subscapular. Yes. In our measurements. Subscapular was the best preserved. Triceps was the less preserved. And low peripheral fat. We have shown in a number of studies. Yes. In the sense that that's relatively well known. Yes. People who have less fat in the legs. Yes. Are more likely to have in other words, fat in the legs is protected. Yes. I mean, that's how I teach students. And again, my take on this was all epigenetic, driven by intrauterine, whatever things are happening. Currently, we have more common transcriptomic, proteomics, and a number of things in a B12 trial. Yeah. And transcriptomic has shown some quite amazing results about change in the cell cycle parameters with B12 supplementation before without many macronutrients. Awesome. Proteomics and other things just started showing things. So I think yeah. proteomics is quite that. Yeah. Then we said there is a paper from Hani Hani Abudkar. I don't know if you've seen it. Either. And it actually is what you should no, play in yeah. the video. Oh, yeah. She used to work in Exeter, with David Perry. Now she is in a university in London. And she has described protective phenotypes, or oh, sorry, protective polymorphs, which give you very different distribution of body fat. So she is talking about protective, we will talk about pre-distribution. So it will be the other side of the coin. That's been mapped out. We have for exome sequencing, we have affimetrix GWAS, so you are most welcome to actually come to us, we can do that analysis, but that's in a population based for the Pune Matter and Nutrition Study. And at 18 years, we did the MRI, and what we found was the strongest associations with four cardiometabolic risk factors were not with visceral fat. But but were with the uh, subcutaneous fat in that study. Yeah. So our conclusion is saying the subcutaneous fat in Indians is more pathogenic than visceral fat. Yes. Though just now we are trying to understand this more in collaboration with Westminster University, who are really the leaders of body composition by image. So I'll connect you with them so that we can also learn their interpretations. So there are a whole lot of things here which I think we can more discuss. I need to understand this because it was quite a bit for me to take in. But this we had raised right at the beginning with Lavinia. Yeah, yeah. And that was March at all influence or Andrew Addersley on me that he was asking me to actually look for dystrophy uh, like sort of genes in the Indians. We didn't find the association that time, but I think with now modern sort of NGS and this, and larger now we could do that. Sir, actually I have already done it. Yeah. I am analyzing the data. LNA gene is showing affected expression in most of the patients. It is the most commonly differentially expressed gene in your uh, thin fat Correct. So I will share my data and I am happy to publish this research. Perfect. And when the expression is different, I always think of expression. My story is function of a gene. Epigenomics or is a gene sequence or some transcription factor or some family or some microarray. That is something which we are not going to discover. So you have seen our paper? In general, the whole last month, or the environment in general is pretty great. I'm going through that. Yeah. What I would suggest is, sorry, for me to just finish and do it. Sir, let us have whole transcript of analysis rather than few microanalysis. Because few microanalysis I have already done for this lipodystrophy gene and other than my hair. But future is whole transcript, whole mRNA sequence. 
and not M. So by collaborating of adding something unique, it is not mRNA sequence, mRNA expression, mRNA tertiary structure which is not coded by the gene code. So we are working on all those concepts. So I will be interested in uh, whatever you are doing. So if you want to do multi we can we can assist you in doing interpretation of the gene. Yeah. And secondly, cleaning the idea is not a very short time. In patient who requires, who has, you know, you look at the hand, if it is very thin, if veins are prominent, jaw is large, and protuberant. So that is not the concept of this. And if you find a mark, it will be less fat and increased. Pushing white, not evolution, or this one. Triglycerin group is good. Always is better. And last and most important, a patient who requires more than two units per kilogram body weight. seconds 57 crore hits and that's how popular diabetes reversal is okay now everybody is talking about diabetes reversal okay now let's start with the story I mean we know the type 2 diabetes is a chronic disease of insulin deficiency and progressive 
beat us and loss. And everybody talks about a reduction of 50% beta cell numbers right at diagnosis. It's been talked about for the last 20 years at least. Now the question is, what is this loss? Is it apoptosis? Or can the beta cell dysfunction be reversed? Okay. We all talk to our patients and say, look, 50 to 60% of your beta cell is gone. I mean, where is it gone? I mean, is it apoptosis? It's dysfunctional? Will it start working all over again? You know, these are the questions. Okay, when defronsose is gone, means hot defronso. Defronsose is gone means it's gone. You know, this is this is how the world has reacted so much. Okay, with that we will start. Simple terms for clinicians who are practicing diabetes: you have hyperglycemia on right side. You start the medication. Will it end when you can stop all the medications and you have normal glycemia? Now, if you have a HbA1c of less than 6.5, yes, it is still in the diabetes level. If it is less than 5.7, probably it's normal glycemia. And if it persists for more than one year, probably you can call it as reversal. Now, the next question is, use of a reversal or remission okay there's there's a big big debate that's been going on so the general description every time you have a major uh, conference where there is a consensus statement then they will say okay now less than 5.7 for more than one year off medication fine i think you can probably call it as reversal i would still say remission i think is the right word now is it possible now the next question with all the combined efforts of diet and exercise and meal plan can we actually reverse diabetes or can we keep it in remission for long periods of time? We know it's chronic. If the measures used to achieve normal glycemia are not sustained, then the diabetes can always come back. And there's enough of evidence and proof. Even if weight loss is sustained, hyperglycemia can resurface due to progressive beta cell dysfunction over time. We have evidence even for this. So at this point of time, I don't think we should use the word reversal. Probably remission is probably a better word. But from the marketing perspective, when the technology specialist is creating something, he would love to use the word reversal because that sells. So people would like to buy that app. I mean, I don't know how uh, CGM helps, uh, glucometer helps. There are programs and apps and all these things are there. So they are using this word reversal. Okay, now what are we trying to reverse? Okay, I, I love the talk of Sandeep actually. You know, understanding the mechanism that causes hyperglycemia, but I'll not go into his adipocyte theory. It's a very simple thing, you know, twin cycle hypothesis and a personal fat threshold. Okay, I'll simply bring this in because this clearly tells us that when you put on weight, you develop type 2 diabetes. Simple, positive calorie balance, increased liver fat, resistance to insulin suppression of glucose production, increase in the basal cell insulin secretion. So this cycle is on the liver side. Then you also have increased triglyceride and the subcutaneous fat storage capacity is exceeded. So the fat gets into the islet cells, so there is a decreased insulin response, and that's a pancreatic cycle where you have postprandial hyperglycemia. And with the plasma glucose levels increasing, then again you have increased basal secretion. So this is the twin cycle hypothesis, which clearly tells us that with a positive calorie balance, and there is hepatic fat, and there is pancreatic fat, and you have type 2 diabetes. And what is this personal fat threshold? Now, this is, this is interesting, and this is where all the researchers can actually come in and contribute over a period of time. It is a concept that type 2 diabetes develops when an individual acquires more fat than the individual can tolerate, even at a BMI, which is in the non-obese category or range. Now, type 2 is a disease of overnutrition, positive calorie balance, and each person has their own level 
of liposusceptibility and there is a potential for reversibility is independent of the BMI. Now on the scatter graph on the right side, right on top, only the red dots. Now the middle one is, what you see in the blue here is, the same set of patients as the first set before they put on weight, okay? So when they put on weight, the shift to the right happens. And the bottom most is a very interesting theory that if you have three groups of people, extreme left, underweight, in the middle, normal weight, and on to the right, overweight, a shift in the weight to the right actually triggers type 2 diabetes, irrespective of your basic weight. So that means each individual has his own or her own level of liposusceptibility. All right. Now, there have been a number of strategies to prove this. The first one is a simple negative calorie balance, diet exercise, weight loss of 15 kgs or more, and that's the weight loss required for your remission. It's far greater than what is needed to control diabetes with medication. So, if you want your HPA1C less than 5.7, if you want to get rid of the tablets, if you have to maintain it, the weight loss has to be at least 15 kgs or more. Anything less, well, you can still control diabetes very well, but then it's not called reversal. So type 2 diabetes and remission, very simple. You put on weight, then you lose weight, and then your blood sugars start to come down. And if the weight loss is more than 15 kgs, it's absolutely brilliant. Now. Another interesting thing happens as you start losing weight. There is normalization of the functional beta cell mass, and this is being shown. And the improvement in the beta cell mass, the first phase insulin release, all that has been shown. And this is after the bypass, right? I mean, the bariatric surgery. Uh, all this has been shown that clearly you lose weight. First phase insulin release is there. Functional beta cell mass actually improves by almost 100%. Your insulin release becomes normal. And again, if you put on weight, all this becomes bad. So the second evidence, of course, the first evidence has come from bariatric surgery, then the low-calorie diets, and a very low-calorie diet, I mean, a very low-carbohydrate diet of less than 50 grams, which is very, very difficult. But then you can try it out on some patients. You know, bariatric surgery, whether it is or in my or gastric pass or a glib gastrectomy, the initial type 2 remission rate is up to 80%. Long term, 5 years is about 30 to 40% remission. And, and this is the mechanism by which it works. Now let's just look at this counterpoint study. This is quite interesting. 600 kilocalorie liquid diet, non-starchy vegetables, 11 people, 8 weeks, weight loss was 15 kgs. That is about 15 to 20 percent of the body weight. And on, on the right side where you see all the graphs, the decrease in the fasting plasma, the basal hepatic glucose production came down, and the liver triglyceride content actually started to drop. So that means you can make somebody lose weight quickly and you can reverse all the metabolic changes of type 2 diabetes. And then you have a counterbalance study. You have a counterpoint study and a counterbalance study. 30 people, duration of diabetes, 6 months to 23 years, 800 calorie diet, 8 week study, weight loss of 15 kgs. Now 40% remission in 8 weeks. You follow them up for 6 months, 43% remission. Now, remission persisted in those who had no weight gain at six months. Obviously, again, if you put on weight, again, your metabolic issues start coming down. And on the right side, A, B, C, you, have, you can see all the parameters coming down. Now, there's an interesting direct study, diabetes remission clinical trial. 306 people, less than six years, 800 calories. One year remission is 46%. Two year remission is 36%. Now, there is also the question of how fast is the response to caloric restriction. Now, this is, this is very, very interesting. Reduction in hepatic gluconeogenesis, normal fasting in seven days, 
reduction in intrahepatic fat content by more than 30% in 7 days, improvement in first phase insulin secretion 8 weeks, normal beta cell function more than 5 months to a year. So, it is possible to give this kind of a calorie restriction to make them lose weight and to reverse the metabolic changes. Now the question is, can we do it in real life? Can we do it in our patients? Research has proved that it is possible at this level to actually make changes. Now the factors of success, less than 5 kg weight loss, remission is only 7%. More than 15 kg weight loss, remission is 86%. And duration of diabetes is a very important thing because the capacity to recover decreases with increased duration. That means if somebody, you, you, you try this remission in him after seven, eight, nine years of diabetes, the success rate is not the same as what happens in the first one to two years. So if the diabetes is more than eight years, there's only 21% remission in the counterbalance study. And the ba baseline beta cell function is something that's very important. And Unfortunately, we can't be measuring it in all of our patients in the clinic. Baseline hepatic and pancreatic fat. Now, this is where I was, I was coming that looking at Sandeep. I, is there a way in which we can measure? Okay. Uh, if there is a way, I mean, especially the baseline hepatic and pancreatic fat, I think this can be a national level uh, you know, research project that everybody can participate and then try to see what happens if there is weight loss in such patients and who responded, who did not respond and things like that. Okay, so that will be a great lecture to listen to anyway. The conclusion is, okay, type 2 is potentially reversible metabolic state caused by excess intraorgan fat. Why does the liposusceptibility change in individuals? There's a question mark, maybe genetic or maybe we don't know, or I will look for answers from the other leaders here. And remission can be achieved with a negative calorie balance and substantial weight loss, but can they continue the diet for long periods of time? Now that's, that's the big, big, big questions. And uh, before I close, after 2020 Diabetes India Conference that happened just before March, end of February. Dr. Sanjay Reddy, who was actually another 10 kgs more or 15 kgs more, had a long chat, again went into a serious diet and then lost 24 kgs, 24 kgs in four to five months. And then the COVID happened <laughs> and then the disease came. Andhra food is very tasty. Everything happened, okay. And uh, I, I, I had gone through the same thing, you know, put on weight, and then in six months I kind of lose weight, and again it, it's a yo-yo effect, and invariably you end up eating, or you find excuses to eat. So the long-term remission requires a continuous effort, motivation, and support. That's the most difficult thing. Anyway, all the best to all those who are making the apps. Anyway, I don't believe in any of these apps which can actually do that. But a huge amount of money is being spent. The valuation of this app is so many crores. That app is so many crores. I, I, I hope things will settle down over a period of time. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for this discussion and receiving the facts from the mix. So I'm sure there should be some questions from our audience. So we'll put it to our audience first. The main question is yes. for people with average weight of 100 kg. 15 kg weight loss huh. is for people who started with 100 kg. Correct. So, so because because all people are going to be between 60 70. 70. Yes, I think that. As I said, two thirds of our young type 2 diabetic patients, where it would be very interesting to do this, were severely insulin deficient. Yeah. And of course, I mean, so I am actually collaborating with them. We are going to do a trial called Indirect. It's Indian Direct Trial. Right. Okay. But I am very careful <laughs> at my age. So I am going to do a feasibility and pilot to actually test these ideas because that hypothesis we had written about what he also mentioned, capacity and load, mm -hmm. which starts from intrauterine life. And if you see our paper, normally it seems to read our papers. In December, Diabetes Care, we have a big paper 
on pre-diabetes in our cohort. 30% had 18 years of age with people who had average BMI of 19. So it's a very different thing mm -hmm. we are talking about. Yeah. And very interesting thing is 30 years ago I had like many other things a brilliant idea of so measuring intra-abdominal organ size and today oh. I can also be a water reward oh. those who had pre-diabetes had slower growth of the liver in the third trimester but they had a relatively larger size of the areas, though it was not a fatty liver so we are now describing something oh. which was preceding the fatty liver but it's all driven by intrauterine poor development of the liver. So they are dealing with end stage disease. I am more fond of primordial prevention, and therefore, in 10 years' time, we might have actually improving maternal nutrition to improve intra abdominal growth of the aliens so that that fat threshold increases. Yeah. So that this is, is all a clinic driven thing, but community based thing will be primordial prevention yeah. and resetting the whole mechanism. Yes, okay. yes, yes sir. Uh, in clinical practice, we see like they have come with 6.5, 7 HPA1C. And after counseling 3 4 months of therapy, they start touching 5.5, 5.6. So we wait for a year to see if it's a revision. Then how can we proceed further to stop the drugs and see if they are bouncing back or where? No, I mean, in the rectals in patients, many times, if it's just an SCA to do with metformin, sometimes this, the NSL will actually stop the medication and they may even like to do it. Now, when once the HPA1C comes down, the initial weight loss of 6, 8 kgs is happening with the SGLT2, you can definitely stop and see what happens in that patient. Okay, and, and many of them, as long as they are motivated and continue to exercise, and as long as they don't put on weight, they remain in that uh, same situation. Uh, I think that, uh, that has happened recently. But again, you know, there are so many festivals and so many marathons, and so many There is always a very standard excuse for this. No, no, I never want to have somebody forced. And, uh, so, you will find all kinds of excuses for this. It's, it's very difficult to stay away from this. Food is a way of life for Indians. You know, we're all eating for dinner today. Okay. <laughs> so it's like you know, it's a way of life. When you're having breakfast, you're discussing lunch, then you're know, huh? having a lunch. Okay. 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 What is happening? So what about grain? Sure, Which one? Grain in response. Because sustainability of diet, all diet would... We don't have grain about grain in response. It's only from some of these uh, studies. But I mean, I haven't done any of this. I, I'm not sure grain in response is a way of life. Very easily, Elijah uh, Pitzer Yeah. Okay. So I am doing lab thing adipose acting. In fact, COVID was cytokine was done in my lab because I was doing diabetics. No, and after you do this rally levels, how do you measure satiety? That changes so much from person to person. How do you measure satiety in clinical practice? And what you measure in saturation is only a broad indication of what happens there. Yeah. But I think what the really question is, is, question is can mm -hmm. Indians at a body weight of 60, uh -huh. are we able to cause a remission and how long will it last? Yeah. I mean the real question like you very rightly mm -hmm. said, how long will it last? Yeah. Because I have seen patients for last 40 right. years who are very vigorous. First three months, six months, UK PDS ka dekho karam. Ki pahle nini jata hai, phir upar jata hai. So that's true everywhere. Now we are using words which are very attractive. Doctors are using the words but someone else is making the money. Exactly. I think one point here, when diabetes remits are normal PMI, not most patients. That's exactly some of these trials, I'm sure, even with low body weight. That's what Sir is now going to try out. Low body weight patients with a 19 BMI, normal BMI of 23, and even higher BMI. If they have diabetes, I think diet exercise has to help them 
in some way or another. If it is not helping to at least reverse the remission, that means the beta cell reserves are very low. I, I, I think you should put them on diet and exercises. All the patients. I am raising one point here. Yeah. How can we increase the capacity to hold the pen? That should be the right strategy. What this right and this body, nothing but decrease the pen. And yes, see the pen. Obi state is something which nobody can change. Obi state is linked to your satiety as well as your sense of pleasure. Any medicine mm -hmm. that on Obi, Obi state can suppress your appetite will lead to societal tendency. I mean, two questions. I mean, I always want to know about this satiety. I mean, why the hunger is so much for one group and not so much? I mean, you can measure rarely and other things. I also don't know why, why the hunger actually increases in pregnancy. So you can tell us. I mean, is it just that there is another fetus which is growing and is that we need to eat more that improves the... It is very nice work from India. It is done by London School of Hygiene, Andrew Prentice. They have set up a unit there for the last 60 years. And one of the most interesting epigenetic programming by maternal undernutrition, and which is what I call hungry fetus, is MC4R receptors in the brain, which are the melanocortin 4 receptors. Now, if you go to last time, uh, whatever, 19, Steve O'Reilly, mm -hmm. he talks of mutations in these genes which produce extreme phenotypes. But intrauterine undernutrition produces an epigenetic phenotype which, if it is hungry in utero, remains hungry for the rest of the life. That's what you are asking. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so if you can actually map this, then we can... You know, yeah, if it's, if it's a girl, you must be able to do it. And then we can tell the boys to be careful, don't yeah, try. Yeah, my can be hungry not just, just for food, for so many other things. So, yeah, so yeah, we can be mapping there. Gopalan oration two years ago was called the story of hungry Indian fetus. Now, do you have a daughter or a son? <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll have to map them now and we'll try to see. So, again, the solutions you are trying to discuss at end stage in clinic, which is attractive to earn money, yeah, or the professor. I am talking of a community solution which will try to solve the problem. And there is another thing, if you are treating in clinic, you are dealing with the right We want to shift the government. If you do this, millions of people will be affected. Here you might be able to help the government. And this is just one thing, I think just like the RSSD, I get all the parts for the city, which is there, and then there's a little bit more supplements there. Even diabetes India is also setting up a dance group, so that there will be a basic research, but this is exactly what we know. Yes, Mr. Rao. And we want the basic research to be more fun than the basic science. Yeah, I'm in conference, so... Basic science. Is there anything urgent? Because I'm in conference right now. So, can I call you later? Sure, sure. Thank you. 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 Which is very important in your clinical medical practice. The secondary diabetes in Lana. And for that, I invite Dr. Sanjay Reddy from Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Reddy is an MBBS and MBBS in general medicine. He is a consultant diabetologist at the Center for Diabetes and Endocrine Care in Bangalore. And also consultant diabetologist at Fortis Hospital. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, and uh, my talk is different. It's not a great, which I like to love to talk about, and also talk why we fail so badly with all the diets. Present. I give you sometimes 16,000 different types of diet. I think over the year, at this point, we get uh, more than 50, uh, more than 5 crores, 50 crores on Google, it's something like that on that. But this is uh, uh, something else. I'm just going to do a clinical talk based on 
uh, what we have. But in today's clustering of diabetes, which is more prominent, I don't know how the relevance of uh, LADA, but you have to know it. The reason is a lot of patients who come to us, first and foremost, I remember all teachers telling us, take a good history, take a good family history. If you want to look at monogenic forms of diabetes or you want to classify some of the diabetes. But over the years, now we've learned a lot of uh, clustering which is there and uh, sir, in a new paper, I've not read it, sir, no, but you told me the 60%, whereas in some other studies, the severe insulin deficient type is almost 22, 22%. Now, LADA is latent autoimmune diabetes in adults, which is often diagnosed in individuals who are older than the usual age of onset for type 1 diabetes, often mistaken to be type 2 diabetes, progresses to insulin requirement within six years, and could be prevalent 12, 10, 2 to 12%, but I think with, uh, maybe more, we, uh, maybe more than that in our population. I'm really not sure of, there are papers earlier, but uh, the data still says it's on 12%. Now, how do you distinguish in the clinic if it is uh, between LADA and type 2 diabetes? These are some pointers over here. Age of onset is usually about 30 years. Type 2 diabetes, I'm not going to talk about. You all know very well. Family history could be negative or positive. HLA susceptibility is increased. Subset, subclinical, rarely acute. M likewise, if you look at most of type 1, sometimes can presume, uh, present acutely. R rate of long-term complication at diagnosis is low. Rate of acute complication at diagnosis is low compared to type 2 diabetes. C-peptide level of diagnosis is decreased, but still detectable. Ketosis is rare. There's increased uh, insulin resistance, so sometimes no change. Beta cell function definitely is decreased. Insulin requirement greater than six months after diagnosis. Body mass index normal. Rarely overweight or obese. These are the thin individuals. So if somebody is coming with a low BMI, whatever age group, please suspect LADA. That, that's very unique. Uh, in our patient, you have thin type 2 also, but suspicion of a patient walking with a low BMI should always be there for LADA. Increased cardiovascular risk, and anybody with height, hypertriglyceridemia to normal triglyceridemia, but most important is the BMI. Now, what is the etiology factor? As I was telling, it's autoimmune. So if you have a genetic susceptibility and all the genes present this side, and all the lifestyle factors, definitely this something similar to, it's sometimes called one and a half diabetes because you don't know whether it's one or two and in between. So if there is, uh, there is islet, uh, islet cell autoimmunity, then insulin deficiency. They may be insulin resistant or may not be, but most of the drugs used, some of the drugs which I'll tell you later, uh, we used for diabetes, for LADA, work. And so the pathophysiological me mechanism, as usual, this should be some specific trigger, or it could be a low-grade infection, uh, for, and this causes insulitis, GADA positive, uh, or <coughs> islet cell antibody positive, insulin deficiency, and impaired insulin action. Now, this is the pathogenetic feature. It can overlap anything, type 1, LADA, normal, type 2. So it's very confusing for the day one to make a diagnosis without looking, without following the patient. If you follow, this patient's going to come back to you and you follow them, then you could suspect. But a lot of clinics measure GAD antibodies as routine. I, Many centers me measure GRAD antibodies as routine. Now we have a smaller, affordable machine uh, which, we tr which we use now, uh, and it's cheap, so you can measure GAD antibodies. Unlike earlier days, you need to use um, um, bigger machines and very expensive to have at the clinic. C-peptide and GAD can be measured in point-of-care devices, which are fairly, act I'm not telling they're in comparison with the third generation chemiluminous machines, but if you use uh, them, and you can, in the, in the clinic, we'd use that, but preferably a fasting or a stimulated C-peptide. But even a fasting C-peptide will do C-peptide and GAD antibodies, but make sure that the fastings are well controlled if you want to do that. Need not make the diagnosis in the day one he's coming and sitting in front of you. Take your time, depending on uh, is A1C, treat him, and then later <coughs> you can follow up. LADA involves both autoimmunity and metabolic derangements of insulin resistance. 
Now, these are common symptoms of, uh, they're nothing different in presentation than a normal S1, but if this is the diagnostic criteria set up by the immunological uh, division of the Diabetes Society, three specific criteria, aged more than 35 years, positive autoantibodies to anal beta cell, insulin independence for at least the initial six months after initial diagnosis. So this is one thing. But remember, if you, the LADA patient also can come to your clinic, a clinical scenario where you come with A1C of 12. Maybe you want to give him insulin for six weeks, but then shift him over to tablets. So, it's, uh, so this criteria is are, but you, that means he can be independent of insulin. You can use insulin in the beginning if the A1C is high, but if he's six months of insulin, this is what it is. I'm not going to go here. So this is an algorithm helping you to say, when do you suspect? Uh, if you suspect ladder, you, uh, most important is age and BMI. And if there are any other autoimmune disease and clinical presentation is similar except for the BMI, I don't see anything different in uh, LADA patients in clinical practice. This age BMI are two things which are which strike, and uh, if you you measure GAD antibodies, and if they are positive, measure C peptide, and then you can decide what you want to do. Now treatment, you, they respond to metformin, they respond to glitazones. There's some, uh, there's uh, you can treat them with DPP4 inhibitors but eventually you will require insulin. So these four things are prone. There's data among all of this. I'm not going to go into details with, lack, with paucity of time. Sulfonylureas, everything can be used. But SGLT2 inhibitors, there is no data as such. But rosiglitazone is the only stu studied in ladder, and it did have uh, promising effects, but it had ultimately to be pulled off. That means you can use glitazone too. So, SGLT2 inhibitors have not been studied in ladder. However, some case reports of euglycemic ketoacidosis have appeared. Therefore, this category right now is there's no recommendation. We can also think of now complications are similar, but they have more neuropathic complications. Please remember this. So in summary, suspect ladder in a patient who's young, 30 years and above, but no family history, not very typical type 2 diabetes, but uh, and uh, uh, comes into your clinic, and if he's first six months, if he doesn't require, and then we, they may require insulin very early. So suspicion is the key, and looking at these factors. But ap apart from that, not. And uh, the other thing is, one is the most important suspect, look for, and if you can measure GAD antibodies, majority of uh, clinics do it, and that helps them actually even in the initial phases. But if you're following the patient carefully, you need not make, as I told you, a diagnosis initially. You can get to there. Now, secondary diabetes is like, s now, most of the secondary diabetes is prime, apart from type 1 and type 2. Anything you think of or any condition which leads to uh, hyperglycemic state is secondary diabetes. So these are the causes. Then we have pancreatic causes. You have abnormalities of the endocrine pancreas and the endocrine gut. The, they are all the glucogonoma, stomatitoma. I don't know how many we see, but most common things which you see are pancreatic disorders, probably liver disorders, the genetic syndromes associated with this, or an endocrine excess, um, endocrinopathies like acromegaly. They are all less than 1%, even all the uh, hyperparathyroidism uh, or hyperthyroidism is one which is more common. So if you see these, think of secondary diabetes in them. So if you have a patient with hypothyroid, make sure that you're measuring uh, glucose regularly or any of these uh, other things, other syndromes associated with diabetes. Let me go to two things. Acute pancreatitis, very, import very important if you have to pick up. Now the suspicion of pancreatitis, many of the time, Pancreatitis is missed, especially chronic pancreatitis, mistaken as gastritis and kept, keep on treating with some abdominal pain, but please look for malnutrition and so on. But in acute pancreatitis, hyperglycemia is mean correlated with tissue necrosis and higher mortality. And usually subjects uh, within weeks of the acute attack will become. So if you have a pancreatitis, maybe you may not have during the admission, it goes back home, but make sure you follow this patient for development of diabetes. 
24 to 35% of patients have glucose intolerance and 12 have diabetes, 12% 12 have diabetes mellitus following a single board of pancreatitis. Now, recently I was talking to a pediatrician friend, he told me, you're seeing a lot of pancreatitis in post-COVID in children. There was a sudden, sudden increase of uh, pancreatitis which happened over there, but I don't know if the data is there, but this was a general observation we found pancreatitis occurring in children post-COVID more. So chronic pancreatitis, see here most important thing is ask for somebody complaining of um, uh, indigestion, uh, um, so suspicion here, again talking to the patient really helps. And another thing with chronic pancreatitis is alcohol use. If the patient is a chronic, also alcoholic or uh, there is a lot of alcohol use can cause this. So diabetes caused by chronic pancreatitis requires insulin therapy because of beta cell destruction although lack of immunological destruction may contribute to a slower destruction of the beta cells in chronic pancreatitis than in type 1 diabetes with greater preservation of beta cell function. Remember something, appetite in chronic pancreatitis is there, but patient is afraid to eat if and because of the pain which develops. Now, pancreatic cancer, this also is associated with abnormal islet cell function by primary alteration of islet cells by carcinogen, secondary damage by cancer cells, or stimulation of islet amyloid polypeptide. So that causes cytotoxicity and uh, apoptosis. So here also, and post-pancreatectomy is another thing. And previously, we uh, one of the things, X-ray of the abdomen. Please take this, and uh, we've seen a lot of data taking an x-ray of the abdomen to see, especially in patients, you should suspect uh, chronic pancreatitis. That is the simplest you can do. I know that's not the right imaging modality now, but that's the one you need to do, post-pancreatectomy. So depending on, and cystic fibrosis, not very common, uh, in a, but if a patient from with cystic fibrosis is there, the early in the course of the cell disease, the beta cells may appear normal. The idea is to put up all this is to see that these patients are followed up to, to show to to pick up diabetes earlier and treat it early. And insulin early insulin use is better in them. Hemochromatosis again, uh, I was PGC teaching. If you have um, uh, patients, usually we get these patients from the neurology ward or a gastroenterologist who's worked up for hematochromatosis and these, these patients are referred to you, so please make sure uh, you have them. And then all the hepatitis. So these frequency of pancreatic disorders are acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, all of these, and the development of diabetes and all these pancreatitis are very high. So please have keep a watch on them. And I'm not going to go much into the endocrine tumors of the non-beta cell of the pancreas or the gut that cause glucose intolerance or secondary diabetes. Mention some of them. So, now carcinoid, NFLD, no, this is hepatitis C, even chronic hepatitis, please make sure. But one thing I want to mention, drug-induced diabetes. I think this is very common. So please note and keep, one of the commonest thing you get is uh, steroid uh, abuse, but look at all these interferon, cyclosporin, disoxide, pentamidine, uh, HIV, protease inhibitors. You have patients coming in uh, with retroviral oral contraceptive pills. Now, they also have contributed to this beta blockers, which we all know, thiazide, calcium channel blockers. All of them have been implicated, but keep an eye on this. So, I'll make, make a comment here. Acute ingestion of alcohol has been associated with hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia due to its inhibitory effect on gluconeogenesis. The effect is seen in fasted individuals with depleted glycogen stores who are dependent on gluconeogenesis to maintain hepatic glucose production. Acute large alcohol intake can cause insulin resistance peripheral tissue, particularly in the muscles. When ingested on a chronic basis, Excessive alcohol intake has been associated moderate to severe insulin resistance and glucose intolerance. So beta arginic blocker, I'm not going to the endocrinopathies, and I just like it, it becomes like uh, this. I'm going to give you a lecture and just a rewind as to say that we can should not forget secondary diabetes, LADA, they're all important part of cl classification of diabetes. 
So I rest my case here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for highlighting the very salient points on, and I think uh, LADA is something that we often overlook into our clinical practice. So just because of the lack of time, we can take one question from the audience, if there is any. All right. So if there's not, sir, just a quick summary from your end again uh, for primary clinicians as to what sir, should be the, the most important thing is never pay for the basic basis of medicine. Please don't know what drugs you're taking in the past. First one, look at this BMI correctly, family history, so and third, look at not necessarily that you make the diagnosis in one. Treat the diabetes first, hold it up, and then probably you'll come. The, the story unfolds better over time. ट्रांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लांसप्लां